This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Two simple things. Maybe you've got an idea for a website or a business or a YouTube channel or a podcast, something you want to start knocking around in your mind. Well, the only way to figure out whether that's worth doing is to get it out there to the world. And that can be daunting because it's scary to go and pursue new things. But not knowing how to set up a website is not an excuse. There are no excuses available with Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. You want to sell something online? Yes. Easily set up a store with Squarespace. You want to do a podcast? Sure. Do a YouTube channel? Well, obviously you want the YouTube channel on YouTube, but having a fine website to complement it, definitely a good idea. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content, or you can just easily move over from an existing domain, making everything easier to manage. Once you've customized your template as well, there are no updates, no patches, no tech BS to deal with. And also, they handle all the website-y stuff, mailing lists, social integrations, and much more. Squarespace removes the excuses to your dreams. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, and let's get into it. There are lots of ways to become rich overnight. You can win the lottery, you can have a rich relative mysteriously perish, or you could wake up with an original Banksy artwork on the side of your building. Thus was the case for Bristol native Dennis Stithcombe back in 2014 when he found his struggling after-school clubhouse, the Broad Plain Boys Club, had a unique addition. Where the city had stuck up some boarding to cover an old doorway, legendary artist Banksy had seen a canvas for one of his most iconic images, mobile lovers. But just like when you win the lottery or kill your rich relatives, the government immediately got involved claiming that artwork, which was painted onto municipal property, was the city's property. At the end of the day, Banksy himself came to the rescue by writing a letter clarifying the Broad Plain Boys Club to be the proper owners. This is just one of a series of strange cases surrounding the world of street art. When someone trespasses on your property and violates vandalism laws to create artwork, who owns it? And how do you even prove something is made by someone with an unknown identity? As it turns out, the question of who actually owns street art is still highly debated in both the United States and the United Kingdom, where Banksy art has been at the center of disputes before. A popular Banksy called Slave Labor in Wood Green, London, caused some small protests when the owner of the pound store on which it was painted decided to sell the artwork at auction. The region was extremely proud of its Banksy and had put up official signage around their tube stop directing tourists towards the mural. When the owner decided to remove it, the locals protested loudly that they wanted to keep the art that had come to be part of their regional identity. However, it doesn't seem like any official legal action was ever taken to stop the sale, and eventually it was sold for £750,000 or $1.1 million US dollars at the time. This was a major win for the guy who owned the store, not just because of the money, but also the artwork was highly critical of the kinds of labor practices used to make the inexpensive products he sold. Things get more complicated in the US, where there exists the law of finders, or its more technical name, finders keepers, which is actually a part of US law, though it's mind-bogglingly confusing. The law of finders gives the rights of lost property to the person who found it, provided they attempt to return it to its original owner, but property is only lost in the specific case that the owner unwillingly parts with their possessions and does not know where it is. Meanwhile, an object is mislaid if the owner puts it down on purpose but then forgets it there. Mislaid objects are subject to different rules than lost objects and are not the property of the finders, but instead they are the property of whoever owns the real estate on which the object is found. How can you tell if someone put something down and then forgot it, or if it fell out of their pocket? Well, that's where lawyers come in. Of course. Enter Peter N. Salib, author of Law of Banksy, who owned street art. The paper makes the argument that street art is affected by law of accretion, which has to do with the legality of Yu-Gi-Oh! fusion cards. In American law, there is a point at which it is recognized two distinct things get so intertwined that they are, in essence, one new thing. Chocolate and peanut butter are both great on their own, but when put together and molded into a cup, they create an entirely new thing. The law of accretion asks if the chocolate and the peanut butter had two different owners who would own the ensuing Reese's peanut butter cup. In US courts, the go-to 
answer has always been the King Solomon answer, split the equity in two. In usual circumstances, an item would be forced to be shared or sold that so the resulting cash can be quickly and easily divided amongst the claimants. Of course, splitting the equity in two is much less of an issue when one of the people involved is committing a crime. In order to claim his half of the value of the artwork, Banksy would have to come forward and confess his crimes in open court. Not only would that make him liable for any of the criminal charges he confesses to, but he may also be forfeiting his rights to the art in the process. In legalese, a willful trespasser generally acquires no rights in the property of another by any change made in such property due to the trespasser's labor or skill, as a party can obtain no right nor derive any advantage from his or her own wrong. Or in plain language, you're not legally allowed to profit directly from walking onto someone else's property to commit a crime. So basically, the arts defaults to being owned by whoever owns the building on which it happens to be painted. This also makes sense when you consider that not every street artist is Banksy and the owner of the building may not qualify a spray-painted El Bato as a museum quality artwork, in which case they might want to paint over it, as happens quite often. The most famous case of street art being painted over came earlier this year when workers in the Tube, that's London's metro system for anyone unfamiliar, scrubbed a series of Banksy paintings off the sides of their train cars. The complete collection was estimated by Joey Sire of MyArtBroker.com to be worth £7.5 million, or just about $9.5 million. No telling if that would have involved the entire train car to get the full experience. Of course, nobody's getting sued, and the Tube even invited Banksy back to do the same thing with official authorization in a suitable location. Of course, this begs the question, how do we even know a Banksy is a Banksy? How can someone whose entire deal is having an unknown identity be identified? Well, it turns out Banksy had the same question. Back after he started getting famous, Banksy discovered that fake Banksies were turning up in auction houses and official numbered prints were being forged and sold. It was for this reason that he founded Pest Control, which still has a website that looks like it was made in 1991. Pest Control's main purpose is to authenticate Banksy works, and if you think you have one, you can send them up to 10 high-res pictures and some pertinent information to find out if you really were the lucky recipient of an honest Banksy. But surprise, surprise, Banksy pieces are getting a lot less common. As his fame has exploded, it's become harder and harder for Banksy to keep his true identity a secret. It's just not so easy easy to remain totally anonymous when you're selling art for millions, getting an Oscar nomination, or creating entire parody theme parks. Specifically, a 2016 project called Tracing Banksy seemed to implicate robbing Gunningham when it used serial killer tracking software to link Gunningham's known movements to the places and times various Banksy pieces were created. The project was soon shut down, however, after Banksy's publicist Steve Lazarides filed a lawsuit citing privacy concerns. If you're wondering why the government doesn't arrest Banksy, you're not a alone. Some have wondered why Banksy gets to commit crimes and walk away scot-free, but the answer seems to be that most cities want Banksy to come and commit crimes there. For example, after a controversial Banksy and tendering was quickly painted over, the local council invited Banksy back to make another mural. As the tendering district council communication manager put it, we are a seaside resort reliant on tourism and it would bring a lot of tourism if we had a Banksy original. Furthermore, as a fairly wealthy man, Banksy may think he doesn't have much to lose. In England, but not the UK at large, graffiti is something of a minor offence that could result in a fine, but probably isn't going to land you in jail. Scotland is a bit more strict, and if Banksy were caught up there, he could be doing three to six months behind bars. The US's laws, as usual, are a huge hodgepodge mess where every city seems to have different rules about graffiti. Banksy may want to stay away from Pittsburgh specifically, where Daniel Montano, the so-called king of graffiti, was caught by graffiti tracking software and sentenced to two and a half to five years in prison. So I think the lesson there is if you're going to do a lot of graffiti, do it in England and make sure it's incredibly valuable. Bonus fact. In 2001, a record-setting home-run baseball hit by an inexplicably swole Barry Bonds resulted in a lawsuit by the two fans who both claimed to catch it. In Popov and Hayashi, both men claimed to have been the first to take possession of the ball. Popov, who had caught the ball in his hand, was then tackled by the nearby crowd, who all hoped to get their hands on the record-setting ball. Hayashi was knocked down by the same crowd, but happened to land near the now-dislodged ball. Suddenly, actual real-life judges who had spent years going through law school and legal practice were thrust into the roles of 
umpires trying to see if Popov actually had possession of the ball before he was tackled. They also had to rule that the ball was intentionally abandoned by Major League Baseball as soon as Barry Bonds hit, which basically means that all games of baseball include the league desperately trying to give their balls away and players refusing to take them. In the end, the judge ruled that both men had to share the profits from selling the ball at auction, where it sold to comic book writer Todd McFarlane of Spawn fame for $450,000. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and thank you for watching.